You know, it's really cool the way, you know, people honor Christmas, you know, with the nativities and stuff like that. Because Christmas is a really, really uh, big deal, of course. If it weren't for Christmas, we wouldn't have Easter, right? If we didn't have Easter, you wouldn't have the cross, you wouldn't have resurrection, you wouldn't have salvation. All of those things come together. But, you know, the idea of God with us, Emmanuel, coming to live with us. And because Mary accepted the rhema, the revealed word, you know, when, when it says word there, let it be done to me according to your word, to the angel, that word is rhema, you know. It's God's revealed this to her. Right. That's going to take a lot of courage on her part. This is a really big deal. But a little bit farther down into that same chapter in the scripture, it talks about how Mary's going to go visit Elizabeth. So, so at this point in the, in the uh, Christmas narrative, in, in the beginning of Luke, we want to recap this a little bit, that the angel has visited Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who expressed doubt. So the angel said, hey, dude, since you're not going to believe what I'm saying, I'm going to thump you on the ear a little bit, and you're not going to be able to speak or hear until, you know, the, the baby's here. Because God's word's going to come forth, whether you believe it or not. It's going to happen, and this is what God has chosen. All right. But you got to remember that Zechariah and Elizabeth were both descended from Aaron. They're of the priestly family. This is a big deal. And the Word of God says that they're both righteous and upstanding before God. Just because Zechariah had some doubts about how this could be doesn't mean that he was unrighteous, right? Anyway, they're righteous before God. God chose them as God's choice, right? And so, even if they had prayed about having a child, this is still God's timing and God's choice. So, this is what's happening in parallel. Now, the angels come to Mary and said, this is what's going to happen, like Curtis was talking about a second ago, and reading that scripture. That set the stage for what happens next. And so, we're going to talk about something called Mary's Magnificat. That's the, the song. Some people call it Mary's Psalm as in P-S-A-L-M, or song, S-O-N-G. But Magnificat is the first word in Latin of that passage because Latin at the time in the past was the common language around the Mediterranean, all over the, what we consider the known world at the time, except for China and India, which have their own history. But for the biblical narrative and the progression of Christianity, Latin was the big language. Greek kind of faded out a little bit because of the Roman Empire. Latin took over. And so for centuries, Latin was the primary language. That's why there's so many things in Scripture. If you study Scripture in depth, you'll hear things, passages referred to by their Latin names. And so Magnificat is one of those. And I know that may, some of y'all may think that's a little too technical, but it's important to understand that Magnificat means magnify. Her soul magnifies, glorifies, extols God. And that's how this passage starts. But if we're going to go to understand how this is, we need to see how the Holy Spirit has been active in their lives. Because the Holy Spirit was active in the lives of Zechariah, active in the life of Elizabeth, active in the life of Mary. And the Holy Spirit flows all the way through this Christmas narrative, the discussion of what's going on. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, we see that after the part that Curtis was talking about, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Doesn't tell us which town, but depending on which town, we're talking like something between 70 and 75 miles that she traveled to go from where she was in Nazareth down to Judah, to the town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and, whoops, sorry, hit the button too soon. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the prophetic to the father 
of John the Baptist was that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. If you look at that in the original language, it's while in the womb, okay? Not after he's born sometime. It's from conception on. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we, we know that, that babies hear things, right? You know, that's why, you know, if there's contention and anger in the home, the child is affected by that even before they're born. They hear this, they experience this, they experience the chemical changes from that conflict or the good things and the loving things that are going on there. And so it's an important thing to understand that, that's the, that John heard this at the same time that Elizabeth did. And John's like, hey, dude, you know, Mary's here. The, I'm the precursor for her child. The baby already knew that, whether it understood it all or not, because it's, you know, and, you know, just a tiny pre-born infant. But the issue is, is that it's filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit recognized it. Elizabeth recognized the Holy Spirit being active in their lives. And so she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed as in fulfilled, happy, you know, how, how do you explain what blessed really is? The original word is the kind of thing, in, if you take it out of the biblical context, the, the Greeks at the time, when they say blessed, that they said this in terms of this is how the gods feel. They got it all together. They got provision, money, blah, blah, blah. You know, from their pagan perspective. But they're happy. Everything's cool. When you put it into a Christian perspective of the thing, you're blessed. God has shown His favor on you. Right? You're fulfilled. You're happy. It's kind of like if you receive the shalom peace of God and you really incorporate and receive that into your life, you're going to be blessed and happy and fulfilled and have be contentment have contentment. That's the meaning of this word that's there. So she's blessed are you among women, not greater than other women, but among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How does Elizabeth know that Mary is the mother of her Lord? Did the Holy Spirit reveal that before? Was that part of the prophecy of Gabriel? Or is she operating in the Holy Spirit right now because it says she's filled with the Holy Spirit? So the way I see this is that she's filled with the Holy Spirit and she's uttering word of knowledge. The prophetic type thing, a word of knowledge that she, she realizes who's before her. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Well, Elizabeth is older than Mary. Mary would be a teenager. Elizabeth is older, old enough that she's past being able to bear children except through the miraculous movement of God. <clears throat> so she's an older relative and she's, you know, in the society that they're in, the elders are always greater or superior than the younger generation. So for her to acknowledge the mother of my Lord, this is a big deal in terms of their family relationship and their society. And she says, Behold, well, we would say, hey, pay attention to this. Notice this. When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Now, of course, I've never experienced this, but, you know, those of y'all who have experienced this thing and babies kicking in you, know, so you notice this, you know, and this is not something that you just take lightly. It's like, poof, you know, it, you know, I felt some of those kicks before with Tawny. It's like, ooh, Parker's going to be a soccer player, you know, it's a, yeah, kind of thing. So, you know, blessed for joy and blessed is he, she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, how is this that the Lord spoke to Mary, yet Elizabeth is saying, the mother of my Lord? You know, Jesus said the Father and He are one. They're one. So even though God is with us in flesh now, in, well, in process now with Mary, 
but they're one. And the Holy Spirit is involved with this. So you see this thing of the Father, the Son, the Spirit all operating together in this narrative that God is coming in to humanity to be with us and to be like us. This is Emmanuel breaking into human history to change everything. Everything is changed. Right? And now, I know that some people are going to sit there and they're going to think, well, what does this have to do with me? Right? This is just a story of Elizabeth and Mary having a baby, you know, having babies and stuff. You know, what, what does this mean to us? Now, this is a whole lot more than that. This is about a thing that applies to each and every one of us who are believers. You know, Curtis was talking about that a while ago. And, you know, this is something that is really real for all of us. You know, if, when I was thinking about this this morning, this thing came, kept coming to my mind. You know, Tawny and I went to visit Peyton yesterday, our daughter, and meet her future in-laws for the first time. So we met and we had a nice time and stuff like that. And then we went over to see uh, Peyton's fiance's house. You know, this is their house. This is where they're going to live. This is the first time we've been there. We're doing this. Anyway, we're sitting there and we're talking. And, you know, all this stuff starts talking about wedding plans and all this stuff. So Tawny and them are there. They're having all these wedding plan things that I have no voice in other than what am I going to wear and I show up and walk her down the aisle. I mean, I, you know, let's be real. I, I write a check and I walk her down the aisle. That's the extent of my participation, right? <laughs> you know, so, so they're talking all this stuff and I start reading Calvin and Hobbes because he's got the Calvin and Hobbes books on his coffee table. So I'm going through this because, you know, they're talk I'm, I'm hearing what they're saying and I have a few things to say occasionally that nobody really cares other than, you know, what are you going to wear, you know, and do you write the check and when you have, have you got a caterer yet, you know. Yeah, and, uh, but Peyton later was talking about this thing about, you know, they have this big posse of friends, you know. Uh, if, for those of y'all who have been in this church long enough, you know, you got Elizabeth Anding and, or whatever new married name is. I can't think of it right now. But Elizabeth Anding that was, grew up in this church and, and Liberty that grew up in this church and stuff. They're all part of this friends group, right? Because Peyton's future husband is best friends with Liberty's husband. You know, they grew up together and, all, you know, they're all tight. They got this thing over there in Anna McKinney area, you know, all that. And so they have this big friends group. Peyton was talking about they had the friends group together and they're all there. And she's standing there with the other, her women, female friend things. And they're all talking about the babies that they have now. Of course, Peyton has no baby. You know, she's not married yet. These others are talking about their baby, and Peyton's like, I'm not relating to this conversation about changing diapers and spit up, you know, kind of thing. And so she said, you know, I kind of migrated back to where the guys are over there talking. And these are all firefighters and policemen. So they're talking about going out on call, you know, with fires and police things and stuff like that. And the point, the reason I'm saying this is, is that we sometimes, when it, we look at Scripture, we say, this doesn't apply to me. I don't know how this applies. And I'm, I'm going to make this assertion and hopefully make the case here that this thing of Mary, what she's proclaiming, applies to each and every one of us about how we magnify the Lord through what He's called us to do. You know, it was a great introduction that Curtis had when he came in here and talked about Mary and all this stuff and about what God's speaking to us. What, you know, what do we need to turn over to Him? What do we need to deal with there? And that's, it's totally true because Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So God is already breaking into her life. Her, her relationship with God is one of praise and submission to what God, her Lord, is doing for her. And how is this? Mean? She's carrying the Lord God, who will be Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And at the same time, she's rejoicing in God, my Savior. And notice, though, it's her soul, her spirit, and her body are all tied up into this thing of rejoicing before God. When we magnify God and we lift God up, it's our spirit and our soul and our body are all tied up with that. If you're just doing it out of format because, well, everybody else is doing it, so I guess I have to raise my hands or whatever, and you're just doing it thinking it's out of obligation or something, yeah, that's just, you know, you know your, your, your thought process, your soul or something, trying to imitate. But when you're really praising God, you're going to have your whole mind, your heart, your soul, spirit, body is all engaged with this. And this is where Mary was when she was meeting with Elizabeth because the Holy Spirit is impacting them, impacting them both. And she's like, God's looked on the humble estate of His servant. And she's talking about herself here. He, you know, she's coming from Nazareth, right? You know, and remember the scripture says that, you know, what good, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, that's what it says in the letter, you know, Gospel of John, you know, and one of Jesus' disciples before he starts following Jesus says that. What good can come out of Nazareth? It's not, archaeology shows, you know, people lived in caves, they did this, they did that. You know, it, it wasn't a high-end kind of place. It's not like Jerusalem or something. Okay, what can come out? But she's saying, all generations are going to call me blessed because of what she is doing, because she agreed, let it be done to me as according to your rhema, according to your word that the angel brought, that God has called her to this monumental task. Now let me ask you, is this task going to be easy? Here she is, she's this teen girl, and she's going to carry the Son of God. And she's not yet married. She's engaged, she's betrothed, but she's not yet married, and she's going to go this. And think about it, even in a place like Nazareth, which doesn't have a great reputation, you know, what are the talking heads going to be doing? Yeah, me, 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 you know, about her. It's not going to be easy. She's still going to have to go through all of the, you know, things of labor, carrying the baby, you know, labor, all of that, the postpartum, all of this stuff. And God doesn't make it easy when the time comes, Right? They're in a manger. Remember that. This is, this is, hey, you know, God, if you want to change the world, couldn't you make it a little bit easier on us? Kind of thing. You know, but God calls us to do things, and sometimes they're challenging and difficult because God had a plan. And all of the things that went on with that, with the manger and everything, are all kind of God's plan to say that this is different. This isn't like society would expect. It isn't like sophisticated people would expect. This is like I'm invading the world to turn it upside down and do something totally different. But Mary recognizes that all generations are going to call her blessed for what she is doing. For he who is mighty has done great things and holy is his name. When Jesus spoke to the disciples and told them how to pray, how does he start off with? Our Father in heaven, may your name be held holy. Mary is coming with its same pattern with this. This Magnificat, the thing that she's proclaiming is just like one of the Psalms. Just like one of the Hebrew Psalms. The structure and organization for this is like if it was a song of David glorifying God and being thankful for what God has done. It's the same way. And so he who is mighty has done great things for Mary and his name is holy and his mercy is for all those who fear him or respect him from generation to generation. And now she's getting into the thing about what God is doing through her. He's shown strength with his arm and scattered the proud you know, the, the snotty people who look down on the people of Nazareth, whether it's the Romans or, or you know, the, the hierarchy in Jerusalem looking down on everybody else. God is changing all of that. He's coming to impact that. And he is doing things radically different than the world would expect. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he's sent away empty. And he's helped Israel 
and he remembers what he spoke to Abraham. So Abraham is the father of the faith. Remember that Abraham was promised by God that all the nations of the world, all the people groups of the world, would be blessed through him. And so Mary is taking this back to Abraham, the f father of our faith. Right? And, and so Abraham believed God and trusted in God and was counted unto him as righteousness. She's not referring back to Moses and the law. She's not referring to King David, even though she's descended from David, and so the Messiah would be descended from David, which was commonly understood by the people of its day. They're expecting Messiah, and they know that Messiah is going to come through David, right, through that line. She's of that line. So is Joseph, for that matter. And so, but the promise was made to Abraham, and his offspring forever. Remember, in the New Testament, in Galatians, it says that merely by belonging to Christ were the posterity of Abraham, the heirs that he was promised. And so all of the promises of Abraham apply to us because we've been grafted into the people of God, God's chosen people. And so Mary is proclaiming all of these things. All right, so she's, she's talked about this stuff, about what God has done. And people are going to call me blessed because of what God is doing through me and the work that she is doing. Now, I told you that stuff about how does this apply to us? And it may not yet be clear. How does this apply to me? I'm going to say these are the same attitudes that we should have for everything that God calls us to do. And each one of us has been called to do something for God. Every one of us. And, you know, and certainly none of us are going to do what Mary did. Okay, that was a one-time thing, right? None of us are going to do that. But all of us have been called to do something, whatever it is. And some of those things are so big that we're scared and we don't want to touch them because it's like, can God really do something like that through me? And some of them are pretty straightforward, but God's saying, do this. You know, you go up to the church and I'm going to fix the light switch in the men's room that's burned out this morning and, you know, take care of that. Oh, that's a little, you know, you might think that's a little thing, but somebody's got to do it. God's calling us to do that. The light switch is on my chair over there, by the way. So whoever wants to take up that thing. Anyway, the, you know. And so it's like there's always something going on, right? Anytime you want to do something at church, you know, and you're go we're like we're going to have the Christmas banquet this, this evening. That even if this is your first time here at church, you're welcome to come to the Christmas banquet and enjoy the, the brisket and everything else that's going to be here. Just show up. The, but the, the deal is, is every time it seems like you're going to try and do something, something happens. The other side gets mad. Every time you try and advance the kingdom of God, the kingdom of darkness gets upset. Or I'm going to sit here and trip over the point, and you know, you know, do something. The, the idea is, is that something seems to happen, like the light switch burning out in the restroom this morning. Poof! Well, why? But things, there's always challenges, right? But God works everything for the good. And so it's all going to be okay. But the idea here is, is that God's called each of us to do something. Uh, whatever your thing is, it doesn't matter. God's called you to do it. Nobody else is going to do that thing because everybody else has been given an assignment of their own. So if you think that, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will take it up. Well, maybe 100 years from now when somebody else comes along, I don't know. But God has something for you to do. And if you don't believe that, we're going to go look at Ephesians chapter 2. All right? All right. If I can make the thing advance. Okay. It, you know what? I just remembered. That's not in that set of slides that I put up there. My fault. So Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And... If you have your Bibles, you can look over there with me. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loves us, 
right? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. So Jesus was sent out of God's love. Jesus came to dwell among us, to tabernacle amongst us and redeem us from hell, death, and the grave because God loves us so much. So even when we were dead in our trespasses, trespasses there being intentionally doing the wrong thing, even though we know what the right thing is and we go do the wrong thing anyway, that's a trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable richness of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We must make it clear here, you're not saved through doing works of righteousness. As Paul's doing, he's, he's making this really clear. We're saved through faith, through grace. But look at the next verse. For we are his workmanship. You know, he's modeling us like a potter, model, making a vessel out of clay on the potter's wheel. So we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has prepared things for us to do. Mary was prepared for what God intended. Remember, Scripture says that in the fullness of time, God sent His Son, born of a woman, in the fullness of time, God has something for each one of us to do today in the fullness of His timing. What any individual person's thing is, I'm not going to tell you. I'll pray with you and help work you through it if you want to about what God's asking you to do and telling you to do. But there are things that God's called you to do. Right? You want to go to Zambia? Get on the doggone airplane and go to Zambia, right? People ask Tawny, oh, that, that, this is a common question. Well, what does your husband think about you getting on an airplane and going to Zambia by yourself? She's like, yeah, he's happy to get rid of me for a while. You know, it's okay. <laughs> she, she's really said things like that. Well, you know, it's not totally true that I'm happy to get rid of her, you know, but I'm happy that she's going, right? <laughs> It's good for her. It's good for because she's being called to do that. You know, Sherry's probably happy to get rid of Dave occasionally to go to Africa when he was going to Africa, right? And she's going, no. <laughs> she, she's trying to be nice over there. But the, the issue is there's a calling. Do this. Make this happen, right? So whatever it is, you know, Go do it with all your strength and all your might because God's called you to do it. But what should our attitude be? Our attitude should be, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for He has looked on my humble estate. Wherever I'm at, no matter what it is, God's looked at it and He's called me to do something and I magnify God because He's called me to do this and I'm going to do it, whatever it is. You know, I, I you know, okay, Tiffany, I know I'm going to wretch you out, but so bear with it for a second. <laughs> and she, she's used to this, you know, just like I rat Tawny out. You know, anyway, she comes up here with her young ones, right? And they clean the church, you know, Oh, goodness. She, she's a licensed veterinarian, you know. She's in there and she's cleaning toilets for the church. Right? Let's, let's, to, because she feels called to help and do things. All right. Do you think the generations will call her blessed for that? Most people don't even know that that's happening. But I'm telling you, God knows. God honors that. God 
recognizes that and it will impact the future whether it's this church or not but through Evie and Clay and Josh and Caleb and everybody else that she's touching with this setting this example of works of righteousness that God has ordained and called into being see what I'm saying this is the kind of thing that's there you know, Curtis, he's had to deal with all of these crazy little churches that he's been assigned to when he was pastoring churches in the past and all this stuff. Putting up with crazy boards of elders and upset people who get upset over nothing. And they, I mean, you got to live with that. You know, it's, it's my soul magnifies the Lord. He's looked on my humble estate. I glorify God for what he's done through this. Even if it isn't easy, right? You know, putting up with people can be a real pain sometimes. Just like it, it is, it, goodness, it's no different, you know, in a church than it is at Raytheon or CoServe or anywhere else where you got to deal with people. You got people. People are people. Whether they're believers or non believers, they're still people. We're still human. We have to be able to align and interact and work together or whatever. So sometimes it's challenging, right? But God has done great things for Mary, even though it wasn't easy, right? And, uh, and, and we all should be like that. I'm going to give you a challenge here. You want to know, get an idea of what it was like for Mary? There's a really good video representation of this out there that you can find online or Angel Studios, but it's the it's the Christmas special for the chosen from last year, in twenty twenty one, season two at the end. It talks about it shows Mary and Joseph traveling down from Nazareth and they're going to Bethlehem. The challenge is about the donkey and walking and the distance and about running out of water and you're on the trail and deal, but this is, so there's a narrative there that's somewhat made up to fit it all in, but it's talking about how the challenges are there and giving birth to a baby in a stable, and wrapping them in the kind of cloths that they take care of baby sheep with and you know in the winter and stuff. It's gives a real strong impression about what Mary had to go through. She's thanking Joseph for not divorcing her over this. That's scriptural. You can go and see it in the Bible. You know, and all of this stuff that he's taking care of her and the baby and stuff like that. And is this the way you expected it to be? And they're like, I don't know what I expected. But I, it's not this. And, you know, it's, that's real. This is the way it is for us, right, in real life, when God's called us to do something. It's not always the way we expect it to be, but it's good. It may not be easy, but it's good because God's calling us to things that are good. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace. I thank you that you have given each one of us good works to do that you've established beforehand. Even though we are saved and have relationship with you, Lord God, through your grace, through your love for us, you so loved us that Jesus came to dwell with us on earth and to die for us and rise from the dead. We're so thankful for that. We're thankful for this Christmas season. We're thankful for the joy and the good things even though we know that at the same time there's some people having challenges and difficulties. There was a young man that Tawny met in Denton this week. He's going through challenges. He's here by himself. He's recently divorced. He's working. We'll be praying for you, but not just praying. She went and got something, you know, a devotional guide and a Christmas thing and whatever it took it to build him up, to encourage him. We pray for his relationship with Jesus. But the idea that there are works of righteousness, good works that God's ordained for us to do, 
If we'll listen to God, God will give us these things and direct our paths to do these things that will impact generations beyond us, even if no one remembers our name. They will remember Mary's name because of what she's done in God's divine revelation. But that's the same pattern that we continue, Lord God. And we're thankful for that, Jesus. We're thankful that you've given us these things to do. And I pray that you reveal right now, while we're praying about it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, reveal to each one of us through the Holy Spirit what you want us to do. You may have already given direction to people, and they need the encouragement to go carry it out. They need the courage. They need the power and the strength of Holy Spirit coming along and motivating them to get it done. But for some of us, we need a fresh revelation of where do we go from here? I'm here right now. What do I do from here? What are you calling me to do, Lord God? What's my assignment? Show me, Lord God, and then help me carry it out. That I may magnify the Lord, extol your greatness, and bring glory to your holy name. For you, Lord God, are holy, and we can live the kingdom of God on earth right now. I thank you for this, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I have one announcement to make, and then I want to pray a prayer blessing before everybody leaves. We have the Christmas banquet tonight, in case you hadn't heard, okay? I don't want anybody forgetting that, oh yeah, that's tonight because I'm watching football. Okay, you know, don't, I, please show up <laughs> for the thing. And for the guests that are here, you know, you, you're, you are totally welcome to be here tonight if you want. No pressure. You don't have to. We're not, you know, we're not going to do any silly things or whatever, right? Yeah, okay. Now, Erin does have a game that she wants everybody to play because she wanted 20 dice. So I have 20 dice out there, and I don't know why we have, well, I don't know what she's going to do with dice at the table, you know, for the game tonight. She's not in here. She's back there with the, the young ladies. You know, but the, the idea is, is there's going to be things. We have the door prizes. We have stuff like that. Don really wants something that's in the door prize list. Right, Don? Don wants, he, ha he has one picked out. If you get his gift that he's really looking forward to getting for the door prize, you know, you may have to do some negotiation. <laughs> or I'm going to have to go buy a boy to replace it, okay? So, all of that said, <clears throat> that's tonight. Don't forget, 6 o'clock, you know, um, for those of y'all that signed up to bring something for the potluck part of it, please, please do that. No pressure. If you didn't, then that's okay. Show up anyway. You know, there's going to be enough brisket there to satisfy all of the carnivores in the congregation. And there's enough non-brisket there for the veggie plate people like my wife. You know, anyway, so the deal is, is that that's that. So please show up. Please remember. And I'm going to pray a blessing upon you from Scripture that at the funeral that Tani and I went to yesterday, the husband of the lady who was laid to rest prayed over the people who had came for a funeral, like 250-ish people that were there for the funeral. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And may you have the peace of God, the shalom of God, today and every day going forward. Amen. Y'all have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. We'll see you this evening. <clears throat>